We're here. And we're here doing it. We're doing it. Doing a podcast. I was trying to make sure. Yep. Looks like we're doing okay as far as the sound goes. We're recording? We're recording. Oh, you know what? Couple things. If you're on the YouTube, you may notice the microphones are gone. Yeah. We're, the new the new sound equipment. We're struggling. <laughs> we gave up. Okay. Um, this means I talked too loud. Oh. Probably because I leaned too close to the microphone. Hello. <laughs> here's here's a few things we've noticed from the new sound equipment this room not perfect not perfect for audio another thing i talk significantly louder than kara talks that tracks I i'm a loud person i didn't know that i was that quiet you're not it's a thing that's what's so weird i know on this mic it's not like that no but those two it's like i'm whispering to you <laughs> let me whisper to you um i do super 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 appreciate all of you yeah you all are still here for continuing to stick with us tagging um, along i feel like anybody who has not been with us and they just popped in for those last few episodes are probably like what the crap <laughs> what are they doing we're trying and as we've said normalizing imperfection i forgot we're not even supposed to be talking about this remember how i said we weren't going to talk about it no but surprise we have different equipment today okay <laughs> that's all okay one day we'll be in a different room just yeah we have it. we have plans we have big plans okay all right so i didn't I wanted to tell you what I was going to do this episode about. What are there firefighters wandering around our back lot? <laughs> They're just like examining the That's weird. building, I guess, and sipping on their coffee. Okay. I, I I was like, as soon as I had, I was like, oh, I'm going to do it on this. And then my next thought was, oh, I want to tell Kara. And I can't. <laughs> okay. So, um, after Ka- wait, this is the witch's magic murder. Oh my gosh, it's guys. We're so sorry. Which is Magic Murder and Mystery Podcast. I'm Kara. I'm Megan. We're very professional. We're really good at this. Mm. Mm. Okay. It's oh, not like oh. we've been doing it. And it's we not- wanted to talk about our necklaces real quick. Okay. If you're on the YouTube, you can see it. There's my You might have caught it on um, Instagram. So pretty. Um, where's the card? Do you have the card? Oh, yep. Sure do. Sure do. <laughs> One of our listeners reached out and she makes jewelry. It's Erin Rebecca. Yes. Erin Rebecca Jewelry. There you go, guys. I'll put her a link, like her Instagram and all that information in the show notes. But Erin Rebecca Jewelry, and she does like, I mean, just the most beautiful, beautiful pieces. It was so nice of her. And she just sent these to us. And it, you know, it's one of those things where we love getting gifts. Yeah. Well, and you never, you never know, like when someone sends you something, it's like, (laughs) but it's, I mean, if it's going to be a macaroni necklace or if it's. <laughs> I also like macaroni necklaces. Yes. Don't. I just feel free can't to get over it. If you were planning on sending us one, please send it. We how, wear it. How beautiful. Yeah. If you want to send us a macaroni necklace, I'll wear the crap out of it. Mm-hmm. But I think I just, they're so beautiful. I can't. I'm, it was just yeah, such Aaron, a lovely thank surprise. Thank you yeah. so much. We thank love you. them. And if you guys um, are needing gifts for somebody or Hit you just want up. something for yourself, stop recording. No, it's recording. Oh my <laughs> God. Um, Check that out because, you know, support another witch is magic murdery. Yeah. Murdery. Which is another magic goddess. Just support mystery. another goddess. Yeah. Trash witch. Yeah. Okay. Now, back to episode. Back to plan. Back to reality. Okay. After Kara's episode on medicinal cannibalism, not cannabis, which a lot of you all had trouble with that one. <laughs> I'm in favor. Okay. I think we can all agree that's one of the weirder things we've ever discussed, <laughs> but also maybe my most favorite episode we've Yoga. ever done, except for the corpse ride is the only one I can think of. Oh my gosh. I loved doing that one. It's episode 50 about Carl Tanzier and that one cracked me up. Um, so anyway, one of our listeners, Mary, who um, I'm sure she's listening because she's fantastic and she sends me from TikTok. I don't I don't know Mary. She just we know she Found knows John, this podcast. Yeah. Found you on the talk. She um she clearly her TikTok algorithm is better than mine because she sees the best weird TikToks and it's amazing. I don't see them, but she tags me in them, thank goodness. And that's how I get, it always makes me so happy when I see that she's tagged me in something. I'm like, yeah, what's Mine's this gonna full be? of like conspiracy theories, cows, hot <laughs> lesbians, and like random haunted spooky every places. every hot lesbian is on tiktok it's fascinating to it's me it's amazing yeah so anyway um 
she will tag me in them and I'm so happy every time she does. So that episode came out Monday about this past Monday, which yeah. is going to be a week ago from the time this yes. comes out. Um, and then yesterday, which would be Tuesday. So medicinal cannibalism came out Monday on Tuesday. Mary tags me in a TikTok that was about how Victorian people used to eat mummies. And I'm like, which is what we, you know, that's medicinal cannibalism. Yeah. And I was like, how have I never heard of this before yeah. in my life? Yeah. Until you mentioned it. And then the day after the episode comes out, there's a TikTok. I mean, I'm just, for one, the TikTok algorithm is bizarre. Yes. But oh, yeah. um, I'm just fascinated that like suddenly it's out two there. days in a row. It's like. It's out there. Yeah. Anyway. So this made me think more about the Victorian era and just the traditions they had surrounding death. Which are wild. Which led me to today's topic. Well, remember when we did that video on Patreon about, like, the wild ways people di died? Like, the Victorian era, era had so many insane ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's not just the way they die. It's, like, how they yeah. treated death. Like, yeah. And I'll, I'll, I'll get into it in the episode, but, it, like, death was a major part of their life yeah you know okay um post-mortem photography is what we are discussing <gasps> oh my today. gosh i love i mean i don't love this but i love it <laughs> i will say that at the moment like what i thought this episode was going to be about versus what it has become after i actually researched it, it it's different okay i love going to antique stores and Anytime I look at old, 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 old pictures, I'm sitting here thinking, is this person alive or mm -hmm. dead? Me too. That and creepy, I actually talk about that too. That creepy I'm like, is this one of those dead photos? Yeah. Or if you see somebody who looks a little weird, you're like, yeah. are they dead or alive? <laughs> yeah. So um, <laughs> I imagine if you listen to this podcast, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. But just in case, I'm not talking about crime scene photography or like oh, autopsy no, no. photographs or anything like that. These are photographs. Nothing that were, nasty. No. Just, yeah. It's not. It's nothing like that. Um, they're photographs that were taken of people after they had passed away that were meant to be comforting to their grieving families and friends. They often portrayed the dead person as if they were still alive. And many times their living relatives would pose for the photographs alongside them. This was a common practice from the How mid 19th. heart wrenching. I know. And when you look at some of them, well, let me finish the sentence. And then, <laughs> this is a common practice from the mid 19th through early 20th centuries. And you can view them online if you just Google <laughs> postmortem photography. I'll also put a link in our show notes <laughs> to the Thanatos <laughs> archive, and it has a large collection of them. But yeah, when you look at these photos, they are heart wrenching. Yeah. Like, you have parents holding their dead children. Yes. And, and I mean, it is clear oh, that yeah. they are grieving i cannot imagine mm -mm. and i i think like before i actually researched this i was just like why would you want that yeah like, why would that be comforting they just you? want those last memories with them but it's deeper than that well and also yeah like they didn't have iphones like we do we yeah. take snapshots all the time yeah well that's yeah that's like a big part of it so yeah that's what i'll get into but before i get too deep into this let's keep in mind that these photograph Photographs display people's like very real grief. Mm -hmm. And while they seem super weird and morbid to us today, back then it was like a sign of love and like, right. reverence yeah. to have post-mortem yeah, post photographs was, taken. Yeah. yeah, it was like, it got to a point where it was weird if you didn't do this. Right, it was like honoring died. the It dead. was like, yeah, like, well, why would you not do the post-mortem photography if yeah. this person, if you love yeah. them, right? So if you Google these, you're going to see pictures of, siblings where like all of them are alive except one or mothers holding their children who passed away or spouses yeah. sitting with like the love of their lives yeah. holding a book and some no longer living yeah yeah i think the part that makes it feel so creepy is that th the whole trying to portray the dead person as if they aren't dead um that's odd yeah <laughs> and yeah. then i think it's natural to put yourself in the situation and be like Oh my God, that kid is holding his dead sister's hand mm -hmm. or those two little girls are posing with their dead mother. And yep. and that is upsetting to think about because you yeah. automatically go like, if I were that person, how mm -hmm. could I, you know, right. but back then it but just they had a different wasn't train like of that. thought. Yeah. yeah. Um, just like it was normal to eat the skin of mummies because they thought it had medicinal properties and skulls crushed up skulls. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we're not mm -hmm. talking about any other part of that episode. 
Mm. Honey baked tea. Man, our Facebook group <laughs> lit up about that. <laughs> I was like, somebody was like, I was just driving down the road and drinking my this. warm coffee. And I was like, it was all Kara. It was all Kara. I'm a victim just like you. You all are so welcome. So um, I don't really want to focus on like making fun of people who live back then. Right. For the things they, you know. Oh, people do. I mean, I'm going to make fun of the medicinal now. cannibalism yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah. But, but this part, when it's like grief, I don't yeah. want um, These photographs brought people a lot of comfort. What I find most interesting about all this is how differently we feel about it today. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I assume in general, most people don't find this sort of thing comforting now. Right. We find it odd and creepy. Right. And like you Google them and you yeah, like, scroll. And just like you said, we're looking are like people taking who's dead? pictures with like caskets and stuff now nobody yeah um when i googled like some of the photos made me laugh and not because it's funny but it was yeah. like i was so uncomfortable yeah that i was just like oh my god you yeah know, like ooh, ooh. it's like i laugh when i'm uncomfortable you know? right um so the way this particular custom went from a source of comfort to a source of discomfort mm-hmm. is just interesting yeah so first let's talk about life in the victorian age they didn't have all the medical advancements that we have now right. they didn't know as much about preventing or curing disease vaccinations weren't a thing they existed I would um know. but they just weren't widely used yeah <laughs> but then in the 1800s with like the industrial revolution and more people like living in cities and crowding together yeah. and things a lot of factors kind of came together at once and suddenly these infectious diseases became a much more like bigger right problem yeah um, the life expectancy, so the, the deal was if you lived in the Victorian age and you made it to adulthood, you could probably expect to live a while, but it's getting, getting there. That was a problem. Right. The life expectancy was back, back then was like, you'd live to be in your forties. And then 70% of kids lived past five years old, which means about 30% of kids didn't. That's so crazy. It's horrific. Diseases. What are you doing? Who's that? Why is it so loud? I bet it's one of them. One of those firefighters. Um, They're still here drinking their coffee? They're never going to leave. We're stuck with them now. It is one of them. (laughs) Hey, guys. You all just subscribed to our channel. (laughs) Yeah, I didn't mean you're never going to leave like it's a... No, we appreciate your (laughs) business. Diseases like cholera and scarlet fever and measles were rampant. And with no vaccines and no antibiotics... Um, and eating mummies wasn't going to help anything. It was just really common to lose people you loved. <laughs> well, it wasn't. I mean, no, you couldn't. They were. Out you're of not going to beat cholera. By they were out of stock at that point. Crushed up skulls, skulls and jam. Um, death was a really prominent part of life, and Victorians mourned deeply. You know, widows wore black for years after yeah. their husbands died. Yeah. And covered you know, windows. And it was considered windows, like mirrors. inappropriate if you didn't. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sometimes people kept locks of hair from dead loved ones. There's a whole thing where they'd make wreaths from the hair of dead people, which I'm not even going to go into. Mm. But um, mm. it's just to give you an example of how they found comfort in like having these little Material. mementos mm-hmm. and they didn't find it creepy. And I mean, like I, I've mentioned, I think on here before, how my grandmother, I was just, I mean, just love like just, yeah you know crazy about that woman and when she passed away it just rocked me it was ho- horrible mm-hmm. and i still like i have so many of her things and my papa every year for christmas will usually give me like another thing that was hers but like when after she died and we like cleaned out her closet and i remember there were like two sweaters i mean my grandmother was tiny 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 right. like a size two <laughs> and I'm, i mean even maybe a size zero i'm not and so I'll never be able to wear them, but like I took you them. You want to hold, yeah. Because they still smelled like her. Mm-hmm. And I can remember waking up in the middle of the night and going in there and just like smelling it and just crying. And yeah. Just whatever. And I went and bought some of the perfume that she always wore because oh. I just, I mean, the way she smelled was just so good. Anyway, point being, I totally understand having like, I want this thing to remember her mm-hmm. by. It's just that then it was like, they want like a lock of hair or. Right. Like, that's such a different, it's just so deep, much more personal, Yeah, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And if I was like, here's this box of my grandmother's hair, you'd be like, Megan. okay, <laughs> yeah. Megan. you need need to go talk to a therapist, yeah. you know? Yeah. But back then, it was just what you did. So, yeah, 
Um, for years, people would commission portraits or sculptures of their deceased loved ones as a way to remember them. Right. And remember death masks? Those came up in episode 52 yes. about the corpse bride. Mm -hmm. um, but basically, uh, after a person died, a mask maker would spread oil over their face and then press plaster over the person's features. The whole point is it was supposed to be as realistic as possible. Um, and so it would create an absolute likeness of the deceased person. Oh, my gosh. Victorians didn't invent this. Like, they've been making death masks right. mm -hmm. since ancient times. But yeah. Victorians were, like, obsessed with having them Yeah, made. they're like, guys, we got this. Yeah. And they would, like, put them on their mantles, which I just picture as, like, you walk into somebody's house and there's, like, this mm. very realistic head on the... I'm, I just, <laughs> I'm like, why? Ooh. But they didn't find it creepy. Like, yeah. I would just be <laughs> like... <laughs> <laughs> the point is... <laughs> Photography didn't exist, so this was the best that you could do. Yeah. But only wealthy people could afford to, like, have a portrait right. painted right. or um, create a sculpture of their dead mm -hmm. loved ones. But then photography came along, and suddenly it was possible for less wealthy families to have some sort of thing to, you know, remember their deceased loved ones. The first type of photograph that was invented was called a mm -hmm. daguerreotype. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's 100%. This was the main mode of photography for like the first 15 years. Um, a daguerreotype was rendered on a copper sheet. I feel like when I describe this, you're going to know exactly what I'm talking about. But it was rendered on a copper sheet and burnished to look like a mirror. Oh. They were three-dimensional. And they came in these little small cases that mm -hmm. were like leather or ebony. Yeah. It had like a little handle. Mm -hmm. You'd open it up yeah. and there'd be this, you know, sheet of like yeah. copper. And like later is they try to make it on cheaper things like mm -hmm. glass or just metal. But... It was like in there and there's like velvet mm -hmm. holding it. And sometimes you, they put other things in there, like a lock of the child's hair or like a ribbon. Um, since the practice of photography was new and it was such a big operation to take one photograph, typically a post-mortem photograph would be the only photograph you had of a person. Right. And this goes to what you were saying. Like now we take pictures all the time, all day, every day. All the time. But back then, that's not how it was, you know? Yeah. So that's really weird to think about. But even if I think about how much it's changed just in my lifetime mm -hmm. about you had to you used to have to go get children. You used to have to go get film developed and oh, you would have no my idea. my gosh, yes. Like you would take a bunch of photos and you would just hope <laughs> that something turned out. Yeah. You would or just, like a selfie. It's it like the am I in the frame. Who knows? Who knows? Who Disposable knows? cameras. You had to wind up mm. and you had oh you did not have screens on them. Yeah. No, there were no screens. You just prayer, basically. That's how you got how snap you got. and shoot, snap and shoot. I remember like the last day of school every year, I would take a disposable camera and then I would just be like, man, I hope some of those came out. Yeah. You know? Yeah. No, I have hundreds, probably thousands of old photos from when we were younger, from when my grandparents were younger, just yeah. in boxes and still old film that I would love to. Yeah. And it wasn't about. like, you know, now you'll take like, a million pictures back then it was like you had to be choosier about it there were like 24 on a disposable on a camera. roll yeah and so or even on so yeah, weird like the roll of film so having photographs taken was just not a normal part of life yet so you wouldn't even you wouldn't even really think about having a picture taken until someone died and even though it was cheaper than a painting it was still expensive it's not like everybody could do this also megan remember pictures are digital now printed digitally oh yeah they used to be hung up in Print yeah, rooms. like dark rooms, you know? Yeah. Um, so photography back then involved a lot of bulky equipment and skill and chemicals. And you had to sit really still if you had your photo taken because the exposure time was longer. Mm -hmm. That's why sometimes in these photographs, when there's like living people posing with a dead person, the living people are a little blurry because they can't be perfectly still. Right. And obviously the deceased person doesn't doesn't have that issue um so one of these <laughs> if you scroll through if you google them you'll see them but like i saw one and i was like oh my god they like focus on the dead person yeah um and blurred out the others but for one i don't even know that that kind of technology existed. right yeah <laughs> it's like they had photoshop back then um but it wasn't a, a photography choice it was just a consequence of how yeah. long it took to they just got fidgety or whatever mm -hmm. they had things back then called cast iron posing stands which kind of look like microphone stands or even those like things that they put dolls in. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and living people would use those stands to try and be as still as possible. Mm -hmm. So when I say long exposure time, it's not 
that crazy. Like right. we're talking about like a minute and a half, right, or so at the but time. It's still of hard the to stand that still. Well, what I read was like it's an exposure. An exposure of even one second is long enough for blurring to happen. Mm-hmm. You know, so when you think about one second versus a minute to a minute and a half, yeah, that's a lot. I mean, think about how awful it is when you're sitting there waiting for a photo to be taken. And you're like, mm-hmm. well, I mean, <laughs> we do that when we're doing our podcast stuff. <laughs> we're like, so we can't stop laughing. Okay. Yeah. Are you taking the picture yet? Yeah. I hate that. <laughs> um. So anyway, back then it was complicated and expensive. And that alone, to me, is a huge part of why this was a thing. If your loved one died and you wanted to remember them, let's take a photo. Right. Because now you can. It was a new technology, and this seemed like the best way to use it. And rather than take a photo of them as a dead person, let's Mm -hmm. make it look like they're alive. Because that makes it more palatable to look at. And just maybe that's more comforting. So. The evolution of the photography went like this. Um, the first post-mortem photographs depicted a corpse posed to look like they were asleep. Okay. It was supposed to look easy and gentle and make you feel like, okay, whatever pain they were in, mm-hmm. it's over. Look how peaceful they look. Right. You know? Then in 1851, the daguerreotype gave away to a new type of photo called the wet collodion process. Hmm. I really love the lessons we learned. Basically, it was a new way of capturing and processing a photo. It was a lot quicker and a lot cheaper, which meant suddenly this was accessible to even more of the general public. So more and more people wanted the postmortem photos. Mm -hmm. That's when we start to see death photos that try to make it seem like the deceased person is alive. They'd pose the body in a chair or like with children. They'd have the child in a chair holding a rattle or Mm -hmm. a toy or something. And a lot of times there'd be like, like a black blanket or velvet something covering the chair so that a person could hide under there and sort of help hold things in place. Mm-hmm. Um, you have to study the photograph. Sometimes you can sort of see like a wrinkle in the fabric or whatever. Yeah. And that's maybe a family member or photographer's assistant holding the child in that position or holding that rattle in their hand right. or something. Those are the ones that are the hardest to look at to me. The other kind where it's like the dead person sleeping, that's, it's the kind of thing I've, you've seen, you know, yeah. at a funeral. That's yeah. what, you know, um, I'm not saying that it looks natural at a funeral, but, right. you know, but seeing a dead person portrayed as alive is not what it's supposed to be. <laughs> so it's yeah. like confusing for your brain. Um, and I guess that's what makes it so uncomfortable. It's cause yeah. you, like your brain registers, like something's not right. Yeah. Know? Sometimes the photographer would add colors color to the deceased person's cheeks like Mm. like little pink just to make it look alive or sometimes they would even paint eyes on the photo to make the person's eyes appear open instead of closed and depending on the skill some photographers were better at that than others Mm -hmm. those are the ones that really creep me out when i look at them yeah So anyway, in the late 19th century, it seemed like the whole grief photography thing became even more focused on the living rather than debt, rather than the (laughs) debt. You say that. (laughs) Rather than the dead. Thank you. The deceased. (laughs) Um, The decedent. Women would pose for photos that showed their, showed them mourning, like, like they're wearing black, they're crying. Oh, yeah. Sometimes they'd have their backs to the camera and like the, the. The deceased person's not in the photo at all. Mm-hmm. Or they'd be like looking at a photo of the deceased person right. and looking sad. And I think that's weirder than the photos of the dead people. I'm just like, what do you want to remember? That for? Yeah. I don't get it. Like I get how looking at a photo of the dead person would be some kind of comfort to you. Yeah. But like here's a photo of me being very sad. Here's a photo of me mourning. It's so strange. Um <laughs> the the grief photo feels like some kind of performance. I don't know. In the 1890s, okay. in the 1890s, post-mortem photography turned toward burial, just oh. coffins and cemeteries and like no pro- no posing the person to look alive or whatever. Then hmm. they'd make postcards of these photos and they'd send them off to friends and relatives, Oh, which is also interesting. It's like, think about how this all started and all the honor and the time put into it. And now it's like a postcard that you throw in the mail and it gets scratched and wrinkled and mm-hmm. handled by strangers. And- yeah. It feels like a fall from grace. One article said this, the postmortem photograph had devolved from a near sacred object to a formality or a social obligation, which is so, it's like, ah, this person died. I got to send out. Yeah. It's like how you send out the graduation announcements or whatever. It's like, thanks for coming. Yeah. The practice of postmortem photography 
seems to have died out in the 1920s, both due to advances in the photography field, but also in medical and health care fields. It's like as life expectancies increased and photographs mm-hmm. of living loved ones weren't hard to come by. Right. There was just no need to continue yeah. to do the death photos. So today there are a lot of people who study and collect postmortem photos. But if you're a collector, you have to be careful that the photos are true postmortem mm-hmm. photos. Um, sometimes there are fakes, but and not even necessarily on purpose, but right. like kind of what you were saying, like when you go look at them and you're like, can't tell. Mm-hmm. There's this one photo of, um, man, I would never have questioned this before. Lewis Carroll? I think so. I think so, too. It's not Louis, right? Yeah. I think so it, it's a photo of him alive. You know, the author, I think he wrote Alice in Wonderland. Um, he's alive in the photo. But it often gets mistaken and lumped in, if you if you Google things, with postmortem photos. <laughs> Because people think like, oh, he that's not a, that's not a live person. He looks he's like just like brought out in a chair with his hand, you know. But he's alive. He's several years before he dies. Oh my gosh. Um, Mike Zone, the owner of Obscura Antiques in New York, offers a rule of thumb when studying Victorian death photos. As simple as it sounds, the big general rule is if they look alive, they're alive, and that rings true. Like when you scroll through them, it's generally fairly yeah. easy to spot the deceased person. So if it's not easy to spot the deceased person, then might not be mm-hmm. a real photo. Yeah. And I guess there is like a such a big market for these like on eBay and, uh, and online websites that like you really do. Like people don't take the time to really investigate it. Oh. They, they just trust that like it's a real photo. That's what it is. There's also a, a one article I read talked about a movie that had created death photos for use within the movie. Um, just to avoid the issue of like, what if you Using accidentally a put yeah. a real person on there? Uh, and then like some of those photos have wound up online oh, as like portrayed like they're the real thing. Yeah. And maybe, maybe people don't realize that they're not real, but yeah, but they're not. So you got to be careful if mm-hmm. you, if you want to start collecting these, yeah. do your, do your investigation, do your so, due diligence. That's it. That's, I love it. It's, it's like when I, when I, when it first hit me, yeah. I was like, oh. Yeah, they're so creepy. And they they are. You know what you should do next? <laughs> Another, like a spinoff of this one. Do the one of the person who started putting the ghosts of people behind the people. Oh, I did actually read about that. Did you? So that right. was a that thing. That one's so interesting. Like Abraham Lincoln's wife. It came up. It became a big thing in the Civil War. Yeah. Where photographers realized if they messed with the exposure time of things, they could make it look like. There's a ghostly Wasn't person. Wasn't it a person that was associated with like Barnum and Bailey or something like that or one of the I circus? mean, there may have been. It, the, what I read was basically like it's a general practice among yeah. spirit photographers is mm-hmm. what they were called. And it was like a way, again, it was kind of a thing where people would find comfort in it. And I, I think it, you know, the Civil War, if you all remember our episode on the Fox sisters, mm-hmm. that's also when their career as medium spiritualism, boomed. like people had suddenly lost all these people they loved. And they wanted they to just communicate wanted to cling with them. To anything yeah. that they had. So it was very easy, especially when you think about how uh, spiritualism was rising and people were like, yeah, the dead or mm-hmm. you can communicate with them. They're still there. Yeah. So it'd be like, yeah, totally believable that these photographers can get pictures. But it's, yeah. it's it was a proven thing that those weren't real. And, you know, if a person moves during the exposure time, it makes them blurry. Right. Like that's what I said here. So if you had a kid, like some of the, if you look them up, those you can look up online too. And it'll yeah. be like. You know, their grandmother reaching for them or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it was all just yeah. a trick of the photography. Or Abraham Lincoln's but it was a hand huge on his business. wife's shoulder or something. Yeah. yeah. It's a huge business back then. Yeah. And it's just interesting how we all cling to things for comfort. So that's it. That's it, guys. That's our Victorian postmortem photography. Uh, I have no idea. I was like, this isn't which is magic, murder, or mystery, but it's it fits. Yes. It fits. Sometimes in those cases, I just claw upon them as mystery. I don't know. Yeah, no, I like it. My brain really likes things to fit in one of our categories. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But here we are. Okay. That's yeah. it. It's a mystery in which category it goes in. That's the, the mystery part. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you for listening. Yes, thanks so much. And we will be here again tomorrow. Tomorrow. Because it's still October. Okay. We love you. Thanks so much. Goodbye. 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 <laughs>